Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 178, Apologists on How God Can Die, Part 1. This episode is a follow-up on Podcast 145 called Tis Mystery All, The Immortal Dies. In this episode, I'm going to interact with some apologists who have addressed how an immortal being can die, and we'll see if they have good answers. What if someone told you that God had died? Would you believe them? Why not? People die. Dogs die. Whales die. Birds die. Amoebas die. Why couldn't God die? Well, God is a god. Sure, but of course, in some of the mythologies of the world's religions, there are deities who die. Sometimes one deity will kill another. Okay, but we're talking about the god of monotheism. We're talking about the uncreated creator. This being is everywhere in the Bible assumed to be immortal. You can do a word search, look for the word mortal in the Bible, and frequently, especially in the book of Job, they'll be contrasting people with God. They'll call someone like you or I a mortal, and in contrast, it's assumed that God is immortal. Immortal means that a thing is not subject to death. It's not mortal. Well, if you're not subject to death, you can't die. It's part of the monotheistic idea of God that a god can't die, really by definition. Now, if we're talking mythology, in some mythology, a being might lose his deity, and a being in mythology might lose his immortality. And if you lose your immortality, then you would thereby become subject to death. So maybe someone tricks a deity into surrendering that status somehow, and now they're mortal, and now they can be killed. So just conceptually, if you lose your immortality, you can die. What about God's immortality? Is this a property that God could gain or lose? I think it's assumed everywhere in the Bible that he can't lose this feature of immortality. In philosophical lingo, it's an essential property. It's a property which he can't exist without having. To say that an immortal being dies is not a contradiction because they might have lost their immortality. Although if you say an immortal being while being immortal at that time when they're still immortal, they die, that's a contradiction. Here's another contradiction. An essentially immortal being died. If they're essentially immortal, they can't exist without being immortal. But if they're immortal, they can't die. But you just said that something that in principle can't die, died. Okay, so it's a contradiction to say that an essentially immortal being dies. Why should we think that God is essentially immortal? I think it's assumed everywhere in the Bible. The Bible doesn't make these kinds of what philosophers call modal distinctions. I would say that it can be established by the long-standing method in Christian theology of using perfect being reasoning. You say, what would an absolutely perfect being have to be like? Wouldn't an absolutely perfect being have to be essentially immortal? Isn't it greater to be essentially immortal than to just be immortal? It seems like it. Now, this is not the same point as saying that a perfect being has to be a necessary being, a being such that it could not fail to exist, a being that has to exist. I think that's true. If God is absolutely perfect, then God has to be something which cannot not exist. His existence is inevitable, which is to say that his non-existence is absolutely impossible. But this is a different point, and it's not exactly the same point that a perfect being has to exist a se, that is, through himself, or independent of other things. I think that's true. I think that to be an absolutely perfect being, you can't be depending on another for your existence or for your perfections. But this is an additional point. The point is that an absolutely perfect being can't not be alive. In other words, a being like this can't be dead. So, a being like this can't die. God, thought of as an absolutely perfect being, has to be thought of as essentially immortal, essentially incapable of dying. 
If he was capable of dying, he wouldn't be the perfect being. Christian theology also says that God is essentially all-powerful and essentially all-knowing. There are some interesting philosophical difficulties about how to understand these divine attributes, but the idea is that God has the greatest kind of power that any being could have. He doesn't just happen to have it, but he has it by his essence. He couldn't fail to have that power. And God knows everything, and he couldn't fail to know everything. He's a perfect being. Just focus on the all-powerful, so God can do things like sustain the world in existence, or perform a miracle, or hear and answer prayers all over the world at the same time. God can do all of these amazing feats. God has powers that go far beyond our powers. Now think about your concept of death. What is death? Our concept of death, and this is the concept that everyone has, whether they're a Christian or an atheist, the concept of death is the loss of all or maybe most of a being's normal life functions. When you die, your heart stops beating, you stop breathing, you stop producing heat, you stop moving. Do you stop thinking? Well, you at least stop thinking with your brain because the brain activity ceases. Once you're all the way dead, that's not going on. Does death involve ceasing to exist? Well, just by the concept of death, we can't draw the conclusion either way. If a Christian and an atheist are at a funeral, and the Christian believes that grandma has gone to be with the Lord, and the atheist believes that grandma has ceased to exist, sure, but they both agree that grandma is dead. What is death? It's the cessation of all or most of a being's normal life functions. The Christian who thinks that a person immediately goes to heaven, the person is alive and functioning in some sense, but they've lost all their bodily functions. They must be living in some kind of immaterial way now, right? Even if they've got some sort of life in heaven right now, they've still lost their normal human life. That's why they are, we all agree, dead. Finally, the New Testament clearly enough implies that God is essentially immortal. 1 Timothy 1.17 says, To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. This straight up says that the one God is immortal. Who is meant by God here? Does it mean the Trinity? No, it means the Father. God in the New Testament is always the Father, unless something in the context specifies that it's talking about someone else, such as the Son or other people. Later in the same book, 1 Timothy 6.13, Paul says, In the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, I charge you to keep the commandments until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, it is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Who is it who alone has immortality? It's God. It's the Father. He's being contrasted in this whole passage with Jesus. And in my presentation, I made this argument. Paul has to have in mind here essential immortality and not simply immortality. Here's why. He says that God alone has immortality. And by God, he means the Father here. So he says the Father alone has immortality. But at this point, Jesus has been raised from the dead and made immortal. If it was only immortality that he was talking about, and he says that only God has it, That would be false, because Jesus, in his view, also has it. Now, if he's talking about essential immortality, only God has that. Only God is essentially immortal. Jesus has now been given immortality. He was raised to immortality in Paul's theology, but he doesn't have it by his essence. How do you know that? Because Jesus died. An essentially immortal being can't die. It's a contradiction to say that an essentially immortal being died. If anybody dies, you know they're not essentially immortal. They might become immortal later. They might have been immortal at an earlier time and then lost it. But if they're essentially immortal, they won't ever die. Contradictions can't be true. We also know that Jesus is not essentially immortal in the New Testament 
because the New Testament teaches that immortality was given to Jesus. You can't be given what you already have by your own essential nature. So what I did in this episode is laid out an inconsistent triad that is three claims that, just by logic, can't all be true. If any two are true, then the third is false. These are Jesus died, Jesus was fully divine, and no fully divine being has ever died. You can tell that this is an inconsistent triad. Let me go through the options. If Jesus died and was fully divine, then it would be false that no fully divine being has ever died. On the other hand, if Jesus was fully divine and no fully divine being has ever died, then it would have to be false that Jesus died. Third option, if Jesus died and no fully divine being has ever died, then it's false that Jesus was fully divine. What do I mean by fully divine here? I just mean divine in the way that the one God is divine. Maybe you think there are degrees or kinds of divinity. I leave the door open for that here. If you have to deny one, if it's irrational to accept all three, which one should you deny? Well, in my presentation, I argued like this. It's an explicit and central New Testament teaching that Jesus died. It's evident by both scripture and reason that no fully divine being has ever died. And so I think the right way to go is to deny that Jesus was fully divine. Catholic tradition has to give way to scripture and clear and compelling reason. The other options are terrible options for a Christian. You don't want to deny that Jesus died just so you can say that he was fully divine and that no fully divine being has ever died. Jesus definitely died, or he couldn't have risen from the dead. You also don't want to deny that no fully divine being has ever died, because part of being fully divine is being essentially immortal. If it's false that no fully divine being has ever died, then at least one fully divine being has died, which is to say that at least one being, which is essentially immortal, died, which is a contradiction. It's nonsense. Can you just deny that full divinity implies immortality? I don't think so. The New Testament straight up says it. It's presupposed in the whole Bible. It just seems like bad theology to think that nothing about being the one true God rules out dying. So the other options are bad. What about just accepting all three and just waving your hands and saying it's a mystery? When you say that, it looks like it's irresponsible for one thing. For another thing, it's not going to convince anybody who's not already in love with this mystery move. If you're trying to convince your Jewish or Islamic neighbor to follow Jesus, that's not the way. They're going to be unimpressed. They're going to give you the blank stare of unimpressedment. If you're just saying, yeah, I realize that those three look like they're inconsistent, then what you're saying is that you don't really care in this case about separating the true from the false. You're just going to go around saying all three things and thinking all three things, supposedly. Yeah, but one of them's got to be false. So that's kind of a turd in the theological punch bowl. You're just saying, well, I like that turd. Really? You don't want to say it's just a mystery. When the Trinity's podcast returns, we'll hear some apologists discussing how God could die. The first thing we'll hear is a very short portion of a debate from some years back between Islamic apologist Dr. Shabir Ali and evangelical Christian apologist Jay Smith. Jay Smith is one of these Jesus is God apologists. He just identifies Jesus with the one God, and it doesn't matter to him that in his own views Jesus and God differ. He has no answer to that. And they're in an argument here about atonement and whether or not atonement makes sense. I'm going to stay away from that topic in this episode. To me, that's another can of worms. A more fundamental point is, how can a fully divine being die? What you're saying is that if you sin against me, I cannot forgive you until I punish myself. 
It doesn't make any sense. If I want to forgive you, I just simply forgive you. What you're failing to understand is that every sin that we do not only has a horizontal consequence, it also has a vertical consequence. No, Muslims don't understand that because say, they don't understand the relationship that is there between God and Look, man. When you say God came down himself and died, then he died on the cross. So that means God died. He it's just getting did. worse every time you go. He certainly did. I don't have a problem with that. If you said the son died, then at least you have the father to, to look after the world. But, but we have no problem. It was God that died on the cross. Why do you have a problem with that? Because if God died, that's blasphemy. Then who would run the world? Who would run the world? <laughs> so the Muslim part of the audience claps and Smith laughs off this objection. Who would run the world if God died? I mean, I guess he's laughing because he thinks the answer is that the Father and the Spirit would run the world because it was only the Son who died. But, you know, he seems to collapse Father, Son, and Spirit into one self, and that one self came on the cross and died. If there's only one omnipotent being in reality, only one being who's capable of being provident over the world, over running the world, or holding the laws of nature together, or whatever... There's only one being capable of doing that, and that being dies, then presumably that being's not able to do that anymore, because death is the loss of all or most life functions. So it's a real question. It's not really a question that's to be laughed off. And it's a question that Islamic apologists constantly throw out there. You say Jesus is God. How could God die? Come on, God can't die. There's another very active and uh, witty and brave and interesting apologist out there named Dr. David Wood. And in a video from several years back, he takes a crack at this question, how can God die? Over the past couple of months, we've received several requests from our Muslim friends to answer the question, how can God die? We heard this objection at the festival from our friend Hakim and from others. Then, just last week, a young Muslim named Ali sent us a YouTube request with the same question. Stated in its full force, the objection would go something like this. Christians believe that Jesus is God, and Christians believe that Jesus died. So Christians believe that God died. But God is eternal and unchanging and all-powerful. What sense does it make to say that he died? The first problem with this is that is not the objection in its strongest form. The objection in its strongest form, and here is a present to the Islamic apologists out there if you want it, the strongest form of the objection is, your scriptures say that God is immortal. So either he's not essentially immortal and he can lose his immortality, or you're saying the contradiction that an essentially immortal being died. Which is it? He mentions the divine attributes eternal, unchanging, and all-powerful. But I don't think those are the source of the problem. Or at least they're not the source of the problem that we're talking about right now. It's another problem, and seemingly a tough one, how an essentially unchanging being could undergo the change of death. But never mind that. Let's hear him out, though, and see how he answers the objection. He starts out by quoting from John chapter 1. He gives a Trinitarian reading of John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And then in verse 14, the word becomes flesh. Here's his payoff. Christians aren't saying that God, as he is in himself, eternal and incorruptible, died one day. The Christian claim is that the second person of the Trinity, who is God, entered into creation, taking on human flesh, so that he could be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. That's what Christians are claiming. So how can a Muslim maintain that our view is somehow incoherent? Here, our Muslim friends might say that God can't enter into his creation, but as a Muslim, you shouldn't say this. In fact, if you say that God can't enter into his creation, you're contradicting the Quran. So then he quotes from Surah 27 in the Quran, and basically it's a theophany. It's where God appears to Moses in a burning bush, and so he says, Aha, see, God can enter into creation. This is a bait and switch. We'll talk about this more later, but the idea of a theophany is not the same as the idea of an incarnation. If Allah can enter into his creation and speak out of a fire, can't he enter into his creation and speak out of human flesh? The correct Muslim answer is, yes, of course, God can do that. He's all-powerful. Christians and Muslims then have to agree that God can enter into his creation. But perhaps a Muslim will say here, okay, God can enter into his creation, but if he does, how can he die? Good question. 
In response, let me illustrate by pointing out what Muslims believe about the Quran. This is a Quran. This Quran, according to Islam, has two natures. On the one hand, as the eternal word of Allah, it has no beginning, it was not created, it cannot be destroyed. On the other hand, this Quran is made of paper and ink and glue. These are physical materials. Muslims ask, how can God die? As if this somehow refutes the Christian view. But let me ask, how can the eternal word of Allah be burned? The correct Muslim response here is this. David, as Muslims, we're not saying that when someone burns the Quran, Allah's eternal word is destroyed. No, when someone burns the Quran, the paper and ink and glue that make up the physical nature of that Quran are destroyed. But the eternal nature of the Quran remains unchanged. Interesting. Let me see if I understand. The eternal word of Allah, which is uncreated and indestructible, enters our world as a physical Quran, which is created and can be destroyed. If this Quran is destroyed, Muslims won't say that Allah's eternal word is destroyed. They'll simply say that the Quran has two natures, an eternal nature and a physical nature, and that it's the physical nature that can be destroyed by burning. How is this so very different from the Christian claim that the Divine Son, the eternal Word of God, became flesh and dwelt among us, that he entered into his creation as Jesus of Nazareth, and that once he had taken on human flesh, his physical nature, since it was created and perishable, was capable of dying, even though his divine nature could not die. My Muslim friends, if you say it's a problem for God to take on a physical form, which can be killed, why wouldn't you say that it's also a problem for the eternal word of Allah to take on a physical form, which can be burned? Several problems with this answer. One of them is, why are we talking about ceasing to exist? I thought we were talking about dying. If you're a naturalist, you might assume that to die implies ceasing to exist. Fine, if you're a naturalist. There are some Christians who think that as well, people who don't believe in a soul. They think that when you die, you cease to exist. Okay, but the issue is not that being fully divine implies that you're a necessarily existing being, a being that can't not exist. Rather, it's that being fully divine implies that you can't die. If someone says, how could God die? And you say, well, God would still exist even if his body died. That, I think, is not relevant. We didn't ask, how could God die and yet still exist? The question is, how can God die? Or, if you like, how could a fully divine being die? Another problem with Dr. Wood's answer is, he kind of carelessly says what classical theology we call an Apollinarian view, sometimes mocked as the God in a bod heresy. The classical Catholic Christian view is not that the eternal word of God assumed a body and that the body died. The classical view is that the eternal word of God at a certain point of time assumed, whatever that means, mysteriously combined with somehow, a complete human nature, body and soul. The general presupposition is, yeah, the soul continues to exist between the crucifixion and the resurrection, but the official classical answer is not that the body died, it's that the complete human nature died. We'll come back to this later, but he's making up a clever answer and a clever comparison here between his understanding of Catholic tradition and Islamic speculations about the eternal nature of the Quran, but it doesn't really seem to be to the point. Maybe Dr. Wood doesn't care about being fully compliant with mainstream ancient Catholic tradition and the creeds and so on. Fine, maybe just let's go by the Bible and what best fits with that. Look, if Jesus' body died a human death, then Jesus' body had to have been a human being. It's only a human being who can die a human death. Only a human being, not merely a body, has a human life to lose. When a human being dies, yes, that implies that something happens to their body. If you go to the morgue and pick up a dead body, you can't kill it. Is there an answer here to our inconsistent triad? Maybe there is implicitly. I think he's affirming that Jesus died. Obviously, he's affirming that Jesus was fully divine. I think he's denying that no fully divine being has ever died. He thinks that if you're a fully divine being and you take a body then you can die. But wait, 
If you're a fully divine being, you take on a body, you still have to have whatever essential properties you had before, and those include immortality. The body that you have taken on can be moved around and puppeted in all sorts of interesting ways, and maybe you can nail it to some wood and you can get rid of it and so on. But whatever happens to that body isn't going to take away your life. If you're a fully divine being, you'll have all the knowledge and power that you had before. You will not have lost your normal life functions. His views might imply that the first claim is false. It's false that Jesus died. If Jesus is just God himself, God uses this body for a while, then discards it. The body gets messed up. Yeah, but God didn't die, right? He just went trucking on along. His life just continued. His divine, perfect life. Of course, I don't think he would ever explicitly deny that Jesus died. That's just a central part of the gospel. I agree. Okay, but if Jesus died and Jesus was fully divine, it has to be false that no fully divine being has ever died. But that seems, Dr. David Wood, like a contradiction. The Quran analogy doesn't address that point. Later in the video, Dr. Wood quotes Paul in Romans saying that God loved us so much that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. Absolutely. Unfortunately, he confuses together God and Christ, and he characterizes this as God himself coming to die for sinners. You won't find anywhere in the New Testament where God himself dies it never says anything like that God pays the price himself. No, he loves us so much that he sends his human son to die. At the end, he kind of suggests that if God hadn't come on his own to die, he would be imperfect. Suppose you were king of the world, dressed in royal robes. One day your servants are carrying you around when you look over and see that your child is drowning in a pool of mud. Wouldn't you throw your robes aside and dive right into that mud to save the child you love? Would it matter to you that you're king of the world? No. All that would matter is your child. If that's how great your love is, how much greater do you think God's love is? Enough to enter creation and die for us? That's the God I'm proclaiming to you. But the argument, Dr. Wood, doesn't work. If it's a contradiction for God to die then it's no hit against God that he doesn't come and die. You can't have an obligation to do something that can't possibly be done. Nor does failing to do something that can't possibly be done show any kind of deficiency in you. It's a bad analogy. God's immortality is not at all like a king's robe, which can just be thrown off at will. To the contrary, immortality is essential to God. In principle, he could not lose that feature. Muslims bring up these objections to show Christians that there's something wrong with our view of God. But as soon as we dig a little deeper, we find that the Muslim view insults and degrades God by limiting his attributes, while the Christian view honors God by displaying his perfection. One definition of God is this. God is the greatest possible being, the greatest conceivable being. So if I can think of a being greater than your God, you're not really worshiping God. I can easily think of a being greater than the God of the Quran. In fact, in at least one way, I'm greater than the God of the Quran. I love unbelievers. Allah doesn't. So my love is greater than Allah's. Of course, my love is nothing compared to the love of the God of the Bible, who demonstrated his love to us and confirmed his message by Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And now he commands all people to repent and believe the gospel. Please don't continue ignoring him, my Muslim friends. The point about the Quran's teaching that God does not love sinners is interesting and I think worth pursuing. However, he says something a little bit too hasty there. He says if, if the way you think about God is such that he can think of a great making feature that God has that isn't one that you believe in, he thinks that it follows that you're not worshiping the same God as he is, that's not right. Two people can worship God, and one of those people have mistaken notions about how God is. There could be two Christians, for instance. One of them thinks that God is all-powerful in the sense that he can make one plus one be three, and make two plus two be five, and he can make square circles, whereas most Christians do not think that. That's nonsense. Those are not possible actions. Yeah, but they're still worshiping the same God. They do manage to co-refer to God, even though the one guy has a mistaken view about God's power. 
Whether Christians and Muslims are referring to the same being, of course, is a somewhat complicated question. We won't go into that here. I'll just say this. I don't think David Wood has a high enough conception of God because his God is not essentially immortal. He needs to pay closer attention to the New Testament and revise his Catholic-derived theology to fit it. When the Trinity's podcast returns, another veteran evangelical apologist tackles the question, can God die? Next clip is from an apologist named Jay Smith. He spends a lot of time interacting with Muslims. And I believe this was in 2016 on the John Ankerberg show. He sets out to answer the question, can God die? Here he's telling about a discussion he had with some Islamic friends. But the first question that was, uh, was there was from the seminarian professor. He turned to me and he said, Mr. Smith, Allahu Akbar, God is the greater. Please don't ever say that God, the greater, the greatest, Omnipotent God became a man, and corrupted himself, became a man. So I turned to my translator and I said, I want you to say this to him. I want you to say, shame on you. He wouldn't do that. I said, no, I want you to say exactly what I said. Shame on you. How dare you say, Allahu Akbar, God is the greater. How dare you say God is omnipotent, but he cannot become a man. Because you've just taken away his greatness. You've just taken away his omnipotence. Don't ever say God is the greatest, but that he cannot become a man. Because my God, if he is truly great, if God is truly omnipotent, it'd be simple for him to be take on human form. Don't ever limit God. This is a baffling response. Well, I think that omnipotence entails that God can become a man or that God can die. At first glance, it looks like it assumes a wrong-headed view of omnipotence. If you think that omnipotence means that you can do anything that we can say, then you just have a nonsensical view of divine power. You think that God could annihilate himself. You think that he could make one plus one be four. You think he could make a five-sided square. You think he could make someone exist and not exist at the same time and in the same way. No, that's just nonsense. Okay, but look, on the Christian's view, on Christian theology, God is essentially immortal. And it's a contradiction to say that an essentially immortal being dies. Because then at the same time, something would die and not die. Something would be incapable of death and capable of death at the same time in the same way. Nonsense. It's no good just to gesture at omnipotence and say that omnipotence implies that God can die. It doesn't. Let's resume Smith's story here about his amazing refutation of his Muslim interlocutors. And immediately he was on the defensive. He could see that I'd caught him, caught him out by doing that. And then he said, well, wait, wait, wait. You, you mean God can eat? I said, yes, my God can eat. Of course he can. I can eat. If your God cannot eat, then you need a bigger God. He says, you mean God went to the toilet? He thought he had me on that one. I said, yeah, my God can go to the toilet. Can't yours? You mean I can do something your God can't do? These are just more junk answers on his part. Just because I can do something, it doesn't follow that God can do it. Omnipotence doesn't mean the ability to do absolutely everything. And omnipotence does not require being able to do everything that a human can do. Omnipotence in Christian theology is generally understood as not including things that imply limitations. Things that imply not being a perfect being. I can screw up. I can sin. I can lie, I can be a crummy person, I can display bad character, I could have a bad day and kick the dog. God can't do these things. But that's okay, he still has the greatest kind of power that any being could have. His power is going to have to be consistent with his other attributes, of course. Okay, but he thinks he's got the guy on the ropes here, so let's see what happens next. So I said to my translator, tell him this. 
here you have spent 10 minutes saying, God can't do this, God can't do this, God cannot eat, God cannot go to the toilet, God cannot walk, he cannot wrestle, he cannot do all these things that I see all the way through scripture. That was God that was walking and talking in the cool of the day. From the very beginning, God was walking and talking. If you're walking and talking, you better have a pair of legs and you better have a voice, you better have a mouth and you better have a pair of lungs. He was wrestling with Jacob. If you're wrestling, you better have a pair of arms and a pair of legs as well. My God was eating in front of the tent of Mamre with Abraham. Of course my God can eat. My God can do any of these. And now you've come and now you have told me, can God die? Again, like Dr. Wood, he equates a theophany with an incarnation. And really those are two different things. Now if you're walking, do you have to have legs? Yes, in some sense. But you don't have to be a man. If you're all-powerful and all-knowing, you can do amazing things. Have you ever seen the holodeck on the Starship Enterprise in Star Trek The Next Generation series? This is a machine that they program to set up various interesting, say, historical situations, like you're going to go back and visit London in the 1800s, and you go into this room in this traveling spaceship, and all of a sudden all this scenery appears around you, and there are these walking and talking characters, Basically, they're like holograms. They're all projected somehow, but these holograms you can touch, you can feel, they can punch you out. Right? It's easy to imagine building a device that makes seemingly real entities that we can interact with. Now, if you're an all-powerful being, you can just do this directly. You can then appear as a man walking in a garden, or as a man or maybe just a humanoid-type figure that wrestles all night with somebody. That doesn't entail becoming human or entering into this mysterious relationship with a complete human nature. As soon as you're done with your interactions, the body would just disappear, presumably. It's just an appearance. That's what a theophany is. It's an appearance of God. Rather than you telling God what he can and cannot do, which you have been doing for 10 minutes, why don't we go back and ask God this question? Can he die? Then I asked my translator to open up John 10. Go and ask, see what Jesus says in John 10. Because mm -hmm. there's Jesus answering this very claim. He says very clearly, he can lay down his life and take it up again. Yes, my God can die. Jesus was claiming it right there. Of course he can die. He can lay down his life anytime he wants. Okay, so he's confusing Jesus and God there, even though the Gospel of John very carefully distinguishes them all throughout. Of course, in that passage, Jesus is not explaining how an essentially immortal being can die. He is predicting his own death and his own resurrection. Well, of course he can die. He's a real man. He's explicitly called a man in the gospel according to John. I think Smith is denying that no fully divine being has ever died. So, well, aha, Jesus says that he's going to die, and obviously he's a fully divine being. Well, no, that's not obvious. In fact, there in John 10, he was making another divine claim. Because only God can lay down his life and take it up again. And Jesus, by saying, for he can lay down his life and take it up again, was saying basically, in very plain English, I am God. There's another place where he's making that claim. Oh... Uh. He then destroys death. In fact, there in John 10, he was making another divine claim because only God can lay down his life and take it up again. And Jesus, by saying, for he can lay down his life and take it up again, was saying basically, in very plain English, I am God. Wow. Why can't a divinely empowered human Messiah lay down his life and take it up again? He just asserts that that's something that only God can do. Well, this is a kind of dodgy argument we see frequently. It's patently over-reading this passage, though. Jesus, in chapter 20, we find, has a God, so he's not God. Go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Please don't ever question whether God can do this or that or another. Don't waste your time saying what, whether he can or not. My God can do anything he wants, except one thing. He cannot lie. He cannot sin. He cannot go against his own nature. I'm glad to see then that Smith agrees that it's a bad misunderstanding of divine omnipotence to think that it implies that God can do anything whatever. 
that is, anything we can describe. So we agree that even the all-powerful God can't do things that go against God's nature, that is, things inconsistent with his essential attributes. That's a synonym for nature. And one of those is that God is immortal. He's essentially immortal, and that's why he can't die. He's right that it's easy for an omnipotent and omniscient being to appear as a man, to interact with humans in a man-like form. Whether he could be a man is another question, of course. My God was there in that bush. That was 1400 BC. If God was there in the bush in 1400 BC, then you should have no problem believing that he could come 2,000 years ago and live 33 years on earth. Please don't ever question God's ability to come to earth. Right. For all he says here, it looks like his views about incarnation are compatible with docetism. Docetism is the view that Jesus only appeared to be a man, but wasn't really a man. He's comparing the incarnation to these theophanies, where God is seen and interacted with in various ways. But we're not going to say, are we, that God became one particular man walking in the garden, he became another particular man wrestling with Jacob, he became another particular man eating, hanging out with Abraham and two angels. We don't need to say that he became a man at all. We need to say just that he appeared in human form. That's what's easy. But if you think that Jesus is God appearing in human form, if that's all you think, you don't think that Jesus was a man. You think that Jesus was God in disguise. That's an officially rejected view, and I think that Catholic tradition was completely right to reject it. Not just because some of those wacko Gnostics were saying it, but because it's an explicit and clear New Testament teaching that Jesus was a real man. It's an interesting question why it bothers to say that, or why it's important. I think it is important, but anyway, it's a clear teaching. It's always been part of the gospel. In the first recorded Christian sermon on Pentecost, the Apostle Peter says this, Listen to these words, fellow Israelites. Jesus of Nazareth was a man whose divine authority was clearly proven to you by all the miracles and wonders which God performed through him. And you yourselves know this, for it happened here among you. In accordance with his own plan, God had already decided that Jesus would be handed over to you, and you killed him by letting sinful men crucify him. But God raised him from death, setting him free from its power, because it was impossible that death should hold him prisoner. Before we leave Jay Smith, one last spiel from him. This is from some Australian TV show. Again, answering the question, how could God die? I think he sort of boiled his answer down to its essence here. Muslims always ask us, how? Mm. How could God become a man? Mm -hmm. How could God die? And we were very firm that we don't question this. You don't ever ask God how he can do it. Uh, of course, God can become a man. That is so simple. And it's, it's, an, it's an affront to God to even suggest that he can't become something that we are. Mm. It's a affront to suggest that he couldn't die and rise again. That's an affront to God. Mm. The question they should have asked is why. That's the better question. That's the real question. To the contrary, it's not at all an affront to say that God can't do something that couldn't possibly be done. It's not blasphemous, it's not disrespectful in any way to say that God can't make a square circle, nor is it blasphemous to say that God can't die, because it's part of Christian theology that God is essentially immortal. Now, if you want to say that Jesus died, like I do, you need to say he's not God himself, number one. Well, of course he's not God himself, he's the Son of God. He's God's Messiah, God's Anointed One. He's a human. He's a man approved to you by signs and wonders that God did through him. But you also can't say that Jesus is fully divine, because a being that's divine in the way that God is divine will be essentially immortal. This shame on you stuff, it's just aggressive rhetoric. It's just subject changing. He's saying, I don't want to talk anymore about how God could die. I think it's obvious that he can die. I want to talk about why God died, so he wants to switch the subject to atonement, where he feels he's on firmer ground. There's no shame in saying that God can't lie. There's no shame in saying that God can't die.
So what's going on here? These are very active and well-known evangelical apologists. They're fairly learned. They're fast talkers. They're good polemicists. They have a kind of charm to them, a confidence, not always well-placed, but anyway, confidence. And yet they're just not able to address really obvious questions that arise just from reading Christian scripture. They're fixated on refuting the Muslims It prevents them from going deeper in solving genuine difficulties within Christian tradition. My solution is clear. I'm a Protestant Christian. I go with Scripture when it conflicts with Catholic tradition. I see that conflict here. Catholic tradition seems to affirm all three, but I think scripturally the first and the third have more support than the second, so to be consistent, I deny the second. If Jesus was divine in some sense, well, anyway, he wasn't fully divine, where that entails being essentially immortal. We know that because he died. And the guys we heard today don't even bring up a whole bunch of terminology and ideas that were part of the ancient small c Catholic tradition. Do they just not know it? Do they think it's not relevant? Or do they just have a desire to change the subject and to avoid hard questions? Do the Catholics do better? Next time, we'll hear from a Roman Catholic apologist and from a couple more Protestant ones, including one who is interacting directly with the presentation of Podcast 145. These apologists we'll hear from next time are willing to bring in the traditional ancient speculations on this subject. Perhaps it's ancient Catholic tradition which can solve our problem. This week's thinking music has been the track Hands of a Pedestrian by Jesse Spillane. If you enjoyed this episode of the Trinity's podcast, please share on social media like Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest. And if you haven't already, please consider setting up a small monthly donation through PayPal. Just look for the orange buttons on the right-hand side of any blog post. listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.